Good morning, First Baptist. I'm Sherry. And I'm Tim. And, and we, we do Wednesday night, night at, at the Esquire. Esquire. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. You're invited to contend and connect on April the 26th and 27th. Registration is open and today is the last day to get the early bird special. You truly won't want to miss this weekend to grow in how to contend for the faith and connect with our community. Register today at fbcbolivar.org slash events to get those $15 tickets while they're still available. We can't wait to see you there. Yes, and join us for Churchwide Night of Worship coming April 21st at 6 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. Our various musical groups from First Baptist will come together to lead us in a unifying and encouraging time of worship through singing, scripture, prayer, and the Lord's Supper. Calling VBS Volunteers. If you would like to volunteer at VBS this summer, registration is open now. Vacation Bible School will be June 3rd through the 7th from 3 to 5.30 p.m. There will be preschool VBS for volunteers children only. Make sure to register on our website. Boy, that sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. You know, this Friday night, the RAs are hosting a Pinewood Derby from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the rec building. This is a great time to see the cars the boys have been working on and how fast they go. Then, on May 1st, our GAs will be having a tea party at 6 p.m. on the third floor. Graduating high school seniors, we want to recognize your great achievement. If you are graduating in May, please go to fbcbolivar.org slash events and fill out our online form so we can recognize you on May the 19th in our morning worship services. Ooh, pancakes. The Great Pancake Feast is our next Sunday morning. Our student and children's ministry will gather together at 9.30 a.m. in the rec building. It's a fun time for children and students to sit and eat together. We hope this will motivate the kids to one day join the youth group and encourage our middle and high schoolers to serve in the children's ministry. Kids can be dropped off and picked up in their normal classrooms. If this is your first time to worship with us, we invite you to text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322. You can also visit our info hubs or the hospitality room after the service where we can meet you and help you connect with First Baptist. Now, watch this. and we talked a lot about um, mountains and how life is full of mountains and valleys. And even though it's cliche, we talked about how life is a journey, not a destination. But we talked a lot about how a mountain isn't a mountain without a decline, it's just an uphill climb. So you have to have that decline in order to see where you've gone from and where you're going to go. I just want to say that the, uh, the worship night last night was super encouraging. Like that was awesome, just seeing everybody gather around somebody and just love on them and pray, pray over them. I always had like this sort of resentment towards one person and we talked about how there's like that little fraction of your heart that you haven't given to God um, because like a lot of Christians, including me, um, we have that just one little thing that we haven't given to God and so this weekend I was able to give God my whole heart so that then he can send me and so he can use me so that, the, so that he can take me on adventures. I learned that God can never waste a hurt, even though when you're hurting, and I never thought about it that way. I've always thought about it of that when you're going through a good time in life, that um, God uses that, but God can use any way he can use any hurt in your life to do all for his glory. This weekend I learned that um, I don't have to worry about what people think about me, or I don't have to worry about I'm not good enough, but I can just be me. And for me, one thing that I learned is 
God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. So if you guys have any hesitation on like pursuing a mentorship role, because it's huge in, in our faith that we're meant to be disciples and discipling other disciples, don't hesitate to do that. Because honestly, I have a lot of words that I wasn't good enough that I didn't have the certain skills necessary to lead younger people. But this weakness taught me that I don't need to be good enough. The Holy Spirit works through me and does that. I came into this weekend a little bit drained in every area of my life. Saturday night, God just worked in ways that I didn't even like expect could happen. There's a lot of girls in my grade that are here right now and everyone else and just the community that was gathered around me last night and I didn't think it would impact me in the way it was. So I'm just grateful for everyone here and how much we care about each other. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are watching online or listening on the radio as well. Um, I, right before the service, I had a song request, and we don't usually do those around here at the last minute, but it's a special day. We have a pastor here at First Baptist that we love and appreciate, and it happens to be his birthday. So, you can guess what song we're going to sing. Happy Now don't ask for any songs next week. <laughs> Let's begin with a reading from God's Word, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9. This is a responsive reading, so let's stand. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The rules of the Lord are true. Amen. Let's sing hymn 339, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of God. 
let's continue our worship with How Firm a Foundation, hymn 456. <laughs> Father, as we come to you in prayer this morning, we are uplifted by these hymns that remind us that we stand on the firm foundation that is you, that is your son Jesus, that we stand on those promises. We have received grace upon grace, blessing upon blessing, and now, Lord, in this time of offering, we have the opportunity to share with the blessings that you first gave us, and as we give of our tithe and offerings, may we be mindful of every blessing, small and great, that we have in you. Amen.
Reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together as we sing hymn 432, Speak, O Lord. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Please take your uh, Bible this morning and join me in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll continue the passage that we were in last week, and today, in just a moment, we'll be looking at the three verses, verses 19 through 21. So 2 Peter 1, 19 through 
21. As you turn there, let me take just a moment to, to address something that it's one of those situations as a pastor to where you're like, man, I don't, I don't know if I need to say something or how much I need to say, and does this require a whole sermon? And the answer is, is maybe, but when it happens on Saturday, you don't think that's the best way to do it. And as I mentioned this, you know, there's things that are going on in our community and in our nation and then globally, and uh, I, I, I always get there's the, there's the tension, and I'm always on the horns of a dilemma. You can, you can always have people that think, well, he said too much. It's kind of what I was saying a couple weeks ago, or, man, you really didn't say enough about that. But there's just some things that I feel like as pastor, you need to hear me acknowledge and say a word about, and at least give a little bit of perspective on you may have saw that yesterday and into last evening, Iran was attacking Israel. And, uh, you know, on a, on a global scale, not, not just a, a biblical scale, but a global scale, that's, that's really a big deal. And um, there are some that look at that and go, well, we know this is, like, this is the fulfillment of a passage like Ezekiel 38. And that means that the end of, uh, end of the world, the second of the coming of Christ is, is near. And so you might have come expecting me to say that or wanting me to say that or wanting me to give a prediction, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sorely disappoint you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give you a prediction or say that, that we know that. I, I think that's dangerous for multiple reasons to do that. You can disagree with me, but I'm not going to do that. But I will say this. There are certainly things right now, right, that are, that are happening on a, on a global scale that I think we we need to pay attention to as believers. It's just a people, but certainly as believers. And, and here's some things that I feel like I could say for certain about these things, and then I think there's three things I can say as far as how we should be thinking or responding to them. Number one, God is aware of these things. No, no doubt in my mind, we serve a God that's aware of these things. And let me, can I take it a step further? And is ultimately in charge of these things and everything else. And they will ultimately come to pass in the time and the way that God determines. The other side of that, as I would say, certainly His Word does address things like this. So I'm not denying that. Um, and certainly it addresses things related to wars, especially as it relates to that, that part of the world. So I think we can definitely say that, and we do well to be aware so the question would be, in this moment, how do I feel confident saying as a, as a people and as a church we should respond? Here's three ways that without a doubt I hope we can agree on that we should respond without question, wherever you are in this. Number one, I, I would say we should, we should pray. We should pray and be on our knees perhaps like we've never been before as a people and as a, as a church. Just praying and entrusting these things to the Lord. Which leads me to the second one. What's the second thing that I would say? As we, tray, as we pray, let's trust God. God is literally the God that holds time in His hands. And He holds all the events of the world. And even the way things will ultimately come to consummation in His hands. Amen? So let's pray and let's trust God. But here's the big thing that I would say, if you want to know how you can respond when this is going on, what we should do. Brothers and sisters, I, I would say the main action it should lead to in our lives and as a church is getting busy about the mission of God in a way like we never have before. We should be more busy sharing the gospel now than we ever have with those close to us and those far. We should be seeking in every, every way possible the salvation of mankind, including those in Iran and in Israel. That's how I would tell you we should respond. Pray, trust God, and be about the business of the gospel. Amen? I hope we all can agree on that. Would you pray with me now? I think that would be appropriate to do as we transition into the time of the message. So, God, we, we are a people that um, we don't have our head in the sand. We are aware and we acknowledge what's going on uh, geopolitically, globally, spiritually, and otherwise, Lord. And, and we would be lying if we did not acknowledge there's level of concern. Uh, we're bothered by these things. 
But yet at the same time, our prayer is we also know you aren't a God who has his head in the sand. You are a God who sees and knows. And you literally have time in your hands. And all of these things will come to pass. And they'll shake out just like you've promised and said that they would. So help us to be a people that trust you, that faithfully walks with you, and understand this has not changed our primary calling. But it is the pursuit of the salvation of everyone around the world by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And help us to be committed as a church and as a people more to that than we ever have. We love you and we thank you for being the God who, who knows and is in charge. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, with that in mind, would you take uh, your Bible and, and turn your attention now to our passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. I think I've mentioned from the platform before that uh, I am a fan of the previous TV show. It's now gone off the air. Mythbusters. Uh, if you don't know anything about Mythbusters, essentially it started with, with two guys that seek to uh, examine both historical and contemporary myths through experiment and science to see if they're either confirmed, plausible, or busted. Now, the good news is, for those of you that are fans like me, even though it's not been on the air for several, several years now, all 20-something or around 20-something seasons can be streamed on HBO Max. <laughs> so there are times that I'll spend hours on end just streaming shows that I've already seen before. It's Holly's favorite thing about me. <laughs> it's our favorite part, her favorite part of our marriage. <laughs> it's in those times that she's just thrilled that she's married to me. If you know anything about the Mythbusters, they have a strong affinity for, hear me say this very carefully, duct tape. And duct tape seems to be one of these inventions that does have magical properties, ev evidently. Uh, it can fix anything. You can make anything out of duct tape. And so several different seasons, they've, they've taken this to the test. So there was one episode where they were stranded on a desert island. All they had was duct tape. Oh, what are you going to do with that? Uh, there was another season where they made a boat out of nothing but duct tape, and they sailed it on San Francisco Bay. Another season where they made, not the engine, but the body of an airplane out of duct tape, and they found a pilot that was brave enough to get it off the ground. Now, he didn't fly very far, but he got it off the ground. My favorite, however, is when they made a, a bridge, not for a car, but for people, out of nothing but duct tape. Is it sturdy enough to do that. And the way they tested it, obviously they wore safety harn harnesses, not made out of duct tape, and they stretched it over a shipping container, and it was pretty deep to see if they could walk across it and it would hold them. Well, the first person across it was actually a guy by the name of, of Adam. And uh, Adam's a little bit lighter than Jamie. He made it uh, all the way across. The problem when Jamie got on there is he had three things working against him. One is after Adam going across it because of the elasticity of duct tape, it had started to stretch a little bit. The structural integrity of the bridge had begun to fail slightly. The second problem is Jamie's a little bit heavier than Adam. And the third thing, if you know anything about Jamie, he is terrified of heights. So you put that combination together, and it was terrible, but it made for compelling 15 minutes of television. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> he got halfway across the bridge and just froze. And he just, his body was shaking so bad, the bridge literally started swaying. It became obvious for Jamie he was no longer on solid foundation. He was no longer on a solid physical foundation. You, you ever been there in life? Can you, can you relate to that? Maybe it's a ladder. Uh, maybe you're in your attic. Maybe you're on a bridge and you, you just... You just don't feel safe. In that moment, you probably got a little bit of worry to you. But you know what is more important than having a solid physical foundation? It's having a solid spiritual foundation. In the world, we look out at it, and the truth of the matter is it, it, it doesn't. Their perspective isn't a solid spiritual foundation. But the, the problem is sometimes those in the church 
don't realize where our solid spiritual foundation lies, and we find ourselves being just as shaky. Now, we could talk about it subjectively as the Holy Spirit being in our life and certainly faith in Christ and His salvation. But objectively, in this passage of Scripture, continuing on last week, Peter's going to talk about where our objective, solid, spiritual foundation can be looked at, read, and found. And it's what we know as the Bible, God's Word. Now, when we think about that, it really leads to a main question. And this is what it all comes down to. Whose word is the Bible? Is it man's or is it God's? And some follow-up questions that become very important for us when we ask that question is, and if it is God's, who gets to determine not just its purpose but its point, what it means? Who gets to determine its meaning? And then maybe another question is, and, and why does that matter to you? Well, I want to look at these three verses continuing last week's passage and try to address these questions. And I, I want to try to address them by once again looking at two points or two truths. The first of these we find in, in verse 19. It's what I'm calling the more sure word. The more sure word. Word. Look with me in verse 19. This is what we read. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. It's the word for sure or certain or confirm. To which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now look at how Peter, in writing to this group of believers, describes this objective, written, solid spiritual foundation of where we should look. The prophetic word more fully confirmed. That's an interesting way to say it. What is he meaning by that? So when you, when you look at it, it looks like two things could be going on here, and I'm not sure that it's either. It looks like he's doing something or making some statement about a comparison or contrast. What, what you did have versus what you now have or what was now versus what is. The other thing it might look like is, hey, there was a time when the prophetic word, whatever that is, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, uh, wasn't certain, but good news is now it is. I actually don't think he's saying any of those things. As a matter of fact, the, the Greek order here, I, I, I think, says something a little bit different than what some of our translations say. It's not that the prophetic word has now been confirmed, when one time it wasn't. The better way to translate it would be we have the more confirmed or the more sure prophetic word, meaning it's always been that way. Since God has started speaking to his people, which, by the way, if you go back to Genesis, it's from the beginning. Since he's been making promises to people since that time, that word has been certain. It has been firm. It has been sure. Now, the question we ask is, what does he mean by the prophetic word? Directly, we would say, well, he's talking about Old Testament prophecy, probably referring to the, the coming, or maybe even the coming, or the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if you look at a passage of Scripture like Luke 24, and you believe the words of Jesus, really all of the Old Testament is, 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 uh, is pointing to or is interpreted in light of him. And so we could say by this prophetic word, he may be referring to the whole or the, 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 the Old Testament as a whole. But if you look at what he's going to say in our next passage, next week's passage in chapter 3, and specifically what he's going to say about the writings of Paul, by extension, it seems to be that he's talking about the entire Bible. All 66 books, 39 of the old, 27 of the new. So if he is talking about that, as, as we have it, what does he mean by it's, it's more firm or it's more sure, certain? Well, to understand, you've You've got to look back at what he was saying before. You remember the false teachers were basically saying, last week's passage, you can live any way you want because Jesus isn't coming back because if he was going to come back, he would have already come back. And Peter's writing and he's saying, no, you live a godly life because the, the, the next life is, is imminent. 
And the evidence or the example, the experience that Peter gives to confirm that is his witnessing of the transfiguration, his firsthand knowledge of the transfiguration. Now, in some ways, think of it this way. We, we are weak. Uh, we, we as, as humans in the flesh, are, are weak. We can, we can doubt. And so because of that, God is gracious, and God gives us things like firsthand eyewitness account, which is what he was doing through Peter. And we look at that, and sometimes here's how we think. Man, I am so glad that somebody or I had this experience because now I know or now I can see or now this has made the word, the promise of God, trustworthy. That's how we can think. That somehow our experience or others, even the apostles, somehow it was that that made the word sure or, or, or confirmed the word. That is not what Peter is saying here. I actually think he's saying the opposite. He's saying, yeah, I gave you my firsthand experience that, by the way, then I wrote down for you, and you're trusting in that, but what he's actually saying to him is, but you should have always trusted. Because even before I told you that, guess what you had? The more sure, the more confirmed prophetic word. You've always had it with you. You've always had the promises of God, and it was always trustworthy. So think of it like this. It is not, the priority is not on our experiences and then secondarily on God's Word. No, 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 we have that wrong, friends. It's exactly the opposite. It's not our experiences that confirm the Word. It's the Word that makes sense of and confirms our, our experiences. And that's what Peter is saying. It's God's Word that has always been certain. And, and the thing is, God's Word, by the way, we, we need it applied to our life. We, we need to understand it for it to be a solid foundation because unless we do, we'll talk about this in a moment, it really does us no good. But here's what I need you to understand. God's Word is true. God's Word is confirmed. God's Word is sure whether you or I believe it or not. It just objectively is. And that's what Peter's talking about. We've always had the confirmed, sure promises of God. And because of that, that's the promise we have. Now, based on that, he gives us a command or a call. And by the way, even if the promise is true, if you don't enact the command or what he says next, if you don't do what he says next, it really still does you little good. Watch what he says. To which you do well to pay attention to. It is my, it's my argument that of these three verses, that phrase, to which you do well to pay attention to, is the main point of what he's trying to get across, is what he's saying. Friends, what we're called to is to hold fast, is to obey, to pay attention to God's certain, firm, and sure word. And when we do that, the solid foundation of our faith is underneath us to support us as a buttress of truth and hope. Now, now listen, some people look at that, and our tendency is to go, well, Pastor, that's legalistic. Uh, you're, you're trying to get us to follow some legal prescribed set of principles. Listen, I'm not talking about perfection. That's why we have the grace of God. But I am talking about objective truth. Brothers and sisters, objective truth does exist. It's out there. And it's true whether I want it to be or whether I follow it or not. And for our good, this isn't something God is doing to us. This is something God is doing for us, for our good, for our blessing. You say, well, why is that? Well, look at the simile he makes next. What should this be like in our life? Why is this for our good? He says, to do, which do you do well to pay attention to, watch this, as a lamp shining in a dark place. Now, now what in the world is he talking about here? Well, it, it, it is a simile, so I think if we try to do a one-to-one -one comparison, like what is the darkness that he's referring to, we might could press the simile too far, but I think the point is it, it, we should approach the Word like that. Yeah, at the same time, I would say all throughout the Bible, there is some understanding that the Bible itself is to bring us light, is to bring us clarity, and, and light and dark places are dark things. You say, well, what are, what are you talking about? Well, for just a moment, think about our series from last summer, from the Proverbs, Wisdom from the Poolside. 
You might remember Proverbs 6, 23. Thy word is a lamp to my path and a light to my feet, right? Peter being a Jew, would he have known that? Yeah. Maybe that's exactly what he has in mind as he's writing this. So if that's the case, what, what might be some of the darkness that we could say God's Word brings, brings light to? Well, I, I think there's a way we can look at this kind of on a, on a global scale, and then we can look at it on an individual scale. Number one, think of just the places the, where the Bible talks about the darkness that is in the world. The darkness that the world is in or under. I mean, think about John's introduction to Jesus in his gospel in chapter 1, right? Jesus came to the darkness. The darkness didn't either comprehend or overcome him. So the world itself is, is under darkness. Now, that, that could refer to perhaps the world is just in confusion. It, it misunderstands. It doesn't know what truth is. I absolutely think that's right. Well, God's Word can bring, bring perspective, a biblical understanding, to even the world so that they can understand what truth is. Think about what Peter, what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, right? And so their heart is dark, and the only way the light can be turned on is through the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit on the inside of their heart, because they sit in, in darkness. Now, this is very unpopular. I, I think it also could be talking about sin and the effect of sin. Remember, in Romans chapter 3, we read, there's none righteous, no, not one. So I think there's a, there's a cosmic darkness that the world sits in that, that is the effects of sin. But, but I also think the darkness also has an individual application to it as well. What do I mean by that? Well, I know before Christ, my own heart was dark. You say, well, Pastor, I'm a I'm pretty good guy. I, I just know my own heart. And I, I know the Bible too well, right? Like the only hope my heart made had was to be remade through Christ. Read the Old Testament, right? He has to give us a new heart. And so it can even be talking about the darkness of, of the individual and the heart and how we need to be clean by Christ. But the good news is the truth of God, the promises of God, the gospel of God overcomes both of those things. It's a light in light of that darkness that, that we see in the world and that, that we experience. So this is the sure word that we have that we should pay attention to because it is a lamp to darkness and the question that you might ask is, well, that's, that's a great, Pastor, but how long do I need to do this? Is there an expiration date on God's Word? Is there a sell-by date on this to where I can set it aside? I'm good. I've reached a point of enlightenment, and I've got that. So, you know, thanks, God. But I, I, the firm foundation is built. It's not going to crumble. Well, actually, it's interesting that Peter does address that. Look at how verse 19 ends. Until the day dawns. This is how long you should do it. This is how long you should pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Well, what's he talking about there? And some people think it's an allusion to this Messiah being the morning star, the, 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 the bright light you will see just before dawn. Some think that's probably referring, if you're looking at the luminaries, Venus. It's the brightest planet in the sky. It's referring to the Messiah. And he's using this, if you will, this this coming of a day, the dawning of a day, is a metaphor for something that God is going to do. And you need to pay attention to his firm foundation that's in his more sure prophetic word until then. But, but what is that? Well, I think it's probably what Peter's already referred to. The power and coming of the Lord. Or the powerful coming of the Lord. What the Old Testament refers to as the day of the Lord. Y'all, Jesus is coming back. I believe that. I think the Bible talks about that. I, I believe that, that, that he will come, and at the consummation of history, he will make things right. Well, how do we understand the coming of the Lord? And how is it, and why is it that Peter seems to be talking about it in two different ways? Objectively, his arrival, and what it will do in the individual's life. We might say, it seems to me that he's talking about two different things there. Maybe, but, but think about this for a moment. The day of the Lord is kind of described in two ways. It's one event, but at least two things will happen. God will ultimately redeem his people, and he'll ultimately defeat his enemies or his enemy, right? And so when we think about that happening, I don't think it's wrong to think of there's an objective event that's going to happen out there. Jesus will return, and that will affect the world. But guess what? 
It's also going to bring joy to my heart individually. There's going to be an objective event. There's going to be a subjective event in my heart. Because listen to me, friends, and don't miss this. If you are a believer, the event that you should be looking the most forward to in your life right now is seeing your Savior face to face. That should bring you more joy, and when it happens, should bring you more joy than anything else. You should be anticipating eagerly that day and that arrival. There's nothing that's going to bring me more joy when we see Jesus. And so the question is, is Peter really saying when that day comes you can put this aside? Well, don't think of it so much as putting this aside as it being fulfilled. You won't need the written word anymore. Why? It's not that God's word is going to go away and cease to exist. You won't need the written word because guess what? You'll be in the presence of the living word. Our faith will become sight. That's what he's talking about. So, so hold on to this firm foundation that we have written until we see live in living color our firm foundation in person, which is Jesus Christ. That's where our firm foundation comes from. That's, a, that's an amen part, isn't it? Amen. amen. So look, this is what I find fascinating. And then we got to move on because I'm going to be out of time. Pastor, you're out of time all the time. You keep going. <laughs> yeah, but I'm trying to do better. <laughs> It's my birthday. Cut me some slack. <laughs> it's interesting that this is not the only passage, if you will, that uses this same type of language when talking about God's promise, God's word, God's gospel, this concept of being firm or certain or sure. Several passages do. It's how, how the New Testament writers seem to talk about this written testimony about Jesus about Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 uses the exact same term. If that which was spoken by the angels proved unalterable, how much more do we need to pay attention to this so we don't drift away from it? How will we escape if we neglect so firm a salvation, so, so, so good, a great a salvation? Listen, because we believe in the promises, the firm, solid foundation of God that He's given us and His promises through His written Word, we do well to pay attention to it to hold fast to it, which really leads, uh, leads us to a, a second question, like why, why does this matter and how does it apply to our lives and how can we work this out to where we have certainty? Well, in verses 20 and 21, I, I, I think we see a second truth that really addresses not just where does the firm foundation come from, but why it matters and, and what do we do with it. So we don't just see the more sure word. But we also see in verses 20 and 21 what I've called the moving spirits word. Listen to what we read here. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Some of you may have seen in the mid-90s, I actually think it was 95, the movie by the same name of the 1970 NASA almost dis uh, disaster that happened with Apollo 13. It starred Tom Hanks, Gary Sinise, Kevin Bacon, and Bill Paxton. Great movie. And uh, essentially, they got in space, and every system that could go out and go wrong on the spacecraft did. So they had a, uh, a lunar module called the Aquarius, and the only thing it was supposed to be used for was two men of the three crew would get in it and take a trip down to the lunar surface and then come back, and that's all it was designed to be used for. But now because of all these systems going out, they kind of have to use it as a space la uh, lifeboat, so to speak. So NASA's trying to make the decision to do this, and they're talking to the engineer. And the engineer says something fascinating. He says, I can't tell you what's gonna do, what it's going to do when you put three men in that for that long because that's not what we designed it for. The engineers were saying, we designed it for a different purpose so we can make no guarantees. And the guy looks at him and says, look, I know what you're trying to do. Basically, you're, you're trying to cover yourself. I promise you I won't hold you personally responsible if it doesn't work. So ultimately, it, it did work, and they got back all safely, and that's, that's great. Matter of fact, NASA today still calls it their most successful failure. Because the mission failed, but they got them all back safe. Listen, God is the engineer. God is the designer of, of his promises, of his word, of the gospel, of our hope. And as the designer, what, what Peter's essentially writing here is, 
if you try to use it for something that God didn't design or engineer it for, there aren't any guarantees. You do so at your own peril, so to speak. That's what he's talking about here. So the question is, not just what is the point, but what is the purpose? How do we understand his word? Well, Peter begins to address that here in verse 20. Here's how he said, knowing this first of all, no prophecy is ever a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, this is where even evangelicals get upset with me, and I've done it before. There's a sense in which we get the doctrine of inspiration. We receive the word by the Holy Spirit working through mankind, okay? We're okay. This is the, you know, inspired word, absolutely. But even evangelicals think that at that point, though, understanding it, they can take it and do with whatever they want to in their life. They can make it say whatever they want. And the moment you say, no, not only did we receive it by God, but there's some objective truth in it as well, this is when you have a revolt on your hand, even in churches sometimes. But this is what Peter's getting at. Not just how we received it, inspiration, but also how we interpret it. It's meaning, what it means in our life. That's that's what Peter's trying to talk about here. There's an intended meaning. Not just how we got it, the content, a content, but what it means, interpretation. He uses this word interpretation here. There are some differences in opinion on, uh, on what this word means. It literally means to untie or loosen. And I am thoroughly convinced that he is referring to the untying or loosening of, of a passage, of a text, of a written, a written, uh, a written t- uh, text to understand uh, what it means, uh, the, the point of it. And, and what Peter is saying here is it's not just the reception of it that came from God, but even how we have to understand it. So the question becomes, is the interpretation of Scripture, what it means, just at the wants and whims of any individual that's reading it? Or is there an orthodox understanding that's intended by God's Holy Spirit himself? And Peter's argument is, you better believe there's an intended meaning, and here's how he makes the argument. He says, it's not a matter of one's own interpretation because it never came, no no prophecy ever came by the will of man. End of verse 21. Instead, men were moved by the Holy Spirit. They wrote when they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's his argument. We can't interpret it anything we want because it's not from the will of man because God moved through his Holy Spirit to write it. So maybe we understand his argument a little bit more logically if we look at it in reverse order. Think about it this way. God's the one that brought about the writing of Scripture. Okay, that's what he says in verse 21. This is the part that's not said, but it's understood. If you gave something, if you created something, that means you own it. God owns it. Therefore, that means God also gets to determine what it means. That's his argument. God gave it. God owns it. God gets to determine what it means. It's not at the whims and wants of anyone else. The idea here is really this. Think about it this way. What Peter is saying, if God moved men to write what they did, if the Holy Spirit moved men to write what they did, then we must trust God to move our minds to understand what we must. That's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit gave it inspiration The Holy Spirit helps us interpret it, interpretation. There's an interesting term that's used in verse 21 that might help make sense of this a little bit more, this moved along by the Holy Spirit. It's a maritime term that often when it's used in other places, such as Acts 21, it it carries with it the idea of a ship being carried along or blown along by the wind. Think about a sailboat. Uh, That's kind of what this is referring to. So if that image makes sense, the idea is these prophets and these people that wrote, they didn't have their their own will, their own desire. If I can play out the metaphor, their own propulsion. All they did was simply throw up their sails and let the Holy Spirit move and blow them where he wanted to. So the idea is, yes, men spoke, But ultimately, God spoke. That's what Peter is saying. That's the firm foundation we have, and that's what we do with it. So, 
So perhaps think about it this way. It is not the whims and wants of man. It's, it's not at the will of man or, or the interpretation of man that determines neither the content, the point, nor the interpretation, the purpose of God's Word. God's Holy Spirit gives us both. So we go back to the original question. You know, why, why does this matter? Whose word is it? Who determines the interpretation? Let me state it positively in the terms of an application. Here's how I would answer that question. We as a church and as a people are called to hold fast to God's purpose and point of his steadfast and sure word. Now, the reason that matters is I'm convinced of this. Someone could believe that this is indeed God's word. Someone could even read it. But if they don't believe there's some intended meaning in it, that God has some purpose for it, that there's not some objective truth in it, but they can just do whatever they want with it, I would tell you even if they do read it, it still has the impact, it still has the possibility of doing, doing them little to no good. Now, why do I say that? Well, guys, there's a lot of cults that will tell you this is the Word of God. They have the same Bible we do, but they end up at a drastically different place than us. Why? Because they don't believe the meaning and the interpretation also comes from God. You see, if you don't believe that God has a point in this Word, then you can believe that it's His Word and read it and still be just as confused, just as lost, and just as hopeless as those who don't believe it. Um, we've already mentioned today that, that today is, is my birthday. Um, actually, yesterday was my niece, Holly's sister's daughter's birthday. She turned 15. I today turned something more than 15. <laughs> uh, because of that, several months ago, she had mentioned that, that she wanted to come. They live in Dallas-Fort Worth. She wanted to come to Bolivar and be here this weekend to celebrate her birthday uh, with her favorite uncle. Uh, and so she's here this weekend. The truth of the reason why she did it probably had nothing to do with me. It's because she wanted to see her cousins. But nonetheless, I was actually this week on a trip for the church, and on Friday, I was leaving Portland, and I had to fly and had a layover in DFW, and then was coming on to Springfield. So I said, great, well, you can just buy her a ticket on the same flight I'm on. I'll pick her up on my layover, and, a, and away we'll go. Sounds simple, does it? Like, nothing can go wrong, right? <laughs> Forgive me if you're a fan, if you work for them, or if you have stock. In steps American Airlines. Uh, they had a phenomenal day on Friday, and by phenomenal day, here the opposite of that, whatever that is, uh, because just about everything that could have gone wrong on that flight from Portland to DFW did. I will save you the details other than I'll just say it was bizarre. We had an hour and a half layover we were supposed to, and we were an hour and a half late taking off. So I'm not great at math, but I can figure out at that point we don't have time to make the next flight. Um, I'm looking, we're making up a little bit of time in the air, and so I'm texting Holly on the flight. She's on the phone with her sister who's at the American Airlines counter at Dallas. And, and I, listen, the problem is she's an unaccompanied minor. So that means not only can she not fly by herself, she, they won't even let her go through security by herself. And they're telling me the whole time, you just need to rebook for a different flight early on Saturday morning. And I'm saying, don't do that yet. Like, like, they don't know who I am. Give me a shot at making it, you know. Just give me a chance to make it. And I'm trying to negotiate back through Holly. I'm like, listen, if they'll let me off this plane first, they'll let her through security without me. She can meet me at the gate, and the gate will hold it just for a few minutes. We can make it. And the authorities that be said, no, no, no. That's what they said. And, uh, and so I was, I was thrilled. I'm like, but these are the circumstances in my life. I really need you to accommodate me. Um, they wouldn't. So literally we're landing, and, I, and they're still to go. Like, we got we to change the flight. And I'm like, Holly, tell them not to change that flight yet. We're on the ground right now. We're on the ground. And so um, the last thing she said to me as we were pulling up to the gate is, they said you've got 13 minutes. Now, I'm in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I've got to get off the plane. 
I've got to get on a tram to go to a different part of the airport. I've got to exit the airport, get my niece, get back through security, and get to our gate in, in 13 minutes. I did it in 10. <laughs> the only person that believed in me was, was my niece. She was telling the same thing. Don't, don't, don't you change this flight. She said, he runs every day. He's been training for this his whole life. <laughs> I was pushing old ladies out of the way. I was in a dead sprint. My, my picture is on some camera somewhere, the no-fly list. But I, but I made it, and we got home on Friday night. Now, why do I say all that? Because the truth of the matter is, here's these authorities, which let me say one more thing. The ironic thing is, they said the reason we can't let her through security is because she's 14. Now, keep in mind, she turned 15 the next day. They said if she were 15, we could let her through without it. <laughs> Listen, in that moment, because of the circumstances in my life, I was wanting them to change their policies. I was wanting them to change those things for me. But the truth of the matter is they're, they're probably in place all of those things for a specific purpose, right? Something's happened or they thought through something, risk assessment. It's for my good, even if I don't know it, and for everyone else's good. Brothers and sisters, we can be like that a little bit with God's Word. God, I, I know this is your Word. I know this is what you're saying what you mean. But God, this is the circumstance in my life. Or it's the circumstance in my family's life. And God, if you would just lighten up a little bit and change that here or let me fudge a little bit, God, things would work out for the better. And God simply says, no, this is my word. This is my gospel. This is my truth. Amen. And it's ultimately for your good and everyone else's that we would come to have the same testimony as the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture. All Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen, amen. and amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Uh, friend, maybe you're here today and um, you've never trusted the promises of God to be certain and firm for your salvation. I would tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. And he will save you today. And I'd love to have the opportunity to talk and pray with you about this. My prayer is that today would be the day of salvation for you. Stop waiting. Would you, would you come this morning? Uh, for the believer in the room, maybe you've hit a place in your life, a circumstance where it's caused you, your, your experience has caused you to doubt the promises of God. Can I remind you again that God's word is certain? God's Word is confirmed. And in God, all the promises in Christ are yes. Would you hear that afresh again today and be reinvigorated to trust once more God and His promises in your life? I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to stand and we're going to begin to respond as we sing. Would you come as we do so? Gracious Father, thank you so much for your word. But thank you more than that, that you are the God that you say you are and you do not change. Because of that, we can trust your promises. We can trust your gospel. We can trust your word for salvation and for living and working and serving for you. Help us today to be a people that does that. Lord, you move in this time and in this place, and whatever you do, we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory. For This is your time, and this is your invitation. It's in Jesus' name that we give you and pray these things. Amen. Would you stand this morning, and would you come as we sing? Let's sing together, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom. 
like to talk to a pastor about following Jesus or being baptized or joining First Baptist, we would love to connect with you. You can text the word connect to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322, or you can catch us right afterward and we'll have those conversations face to face. If you are here for one of your first times and you have not yet had the chance to meet Pastor Adam, he would love to meet you. He'll be right over here in our hospitality room and we'd love to talk to you there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to gather and to worship together as a church family. I thank you for our pastor and for the work that he puts into his, the messages each week. Lord, we, we thank you that we can trust your word, that it comes from you, and we can live by it. We put all of our hope in the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 